to make the world a better place um, and I guess you all want to as well and we're here today to tell you a little bit about our real life stories of how we've worked to create sustainable communities products and production systems which show how we can how we'll be able to live in a sustainable future and, and maybe a little bit of what it will be like and uh, I saw that the blurb for this uh, TED event uh, talking about um, you know the future is going to be really different to what it is now. And uh, it just made me think, uh, when we moved into our eco-village in, in Bedzed, it felt, wow, this is like moving into the future. It's really different and special. And then after two weeks, it was just the new normal. <laughs> so I'll just put it to you that the future is just going to be like it is now, and we just get used to things really quickly. So um, I think one of the first things to think about is um, the science bit. So there's our ecological footprint, and it, it's nothing to be proud of. There's a certain amount of resources on the planet and a certain amount of land to absorb the pollution that we produce. And every year, you know, we've got this sort of quota, like our capital that we're living off, uh, or the interest that we're living off. And uh, we're actually consuming now 50% more every year than the planet can replenish. So that's obviously not sustainable. And if, you, if everyone lived like the average Brit or the average European, we'd need three planets to support us. Like the average American, it would be five planets. The average Bangladeshi, third of a planet. We'd have loads left over. Uh, but, of course, these people need to uh, grow and develop, and we all need to become more resource efficient. And if you tell someone who's in the three to five planet world, come on now, you know, we've, we've got to save resources, it's not really a very attractive proposition or story. Everybody just thinks, well, I like my life and I like it the way it is. So um, what we're saying is that we're going to tell you today some examples to show that one planet living is really possible right now. Um, well, we were back in the early 1990s. I think we were just thinking, well, you know, we were faced with uh, uh, some of the figures around um, uh, the environmental uh, crisis and uh, so we started thinking well what can we do we're living in South London what can we do uh, just to create more products and services which we would use ourselves but which um, would have a positive uh, impact on the environment and a positive impact on society and one of the areas we started looking at was just looking at okay well what are the resources around us from uh, uh, woodlands from farmland um, and waste resources and how can we meet more of our needs using those resources and that's what we sort of call bioregionalism or bioregional development. Um, and one of the areas I started looking at was uh, woodland management in, 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 uh, in the UK. Um, uh, and we had an opportunity uh, to actually reintroduce management to those woodlands and to create products which would replace uh, more unsustainable imports. Um, but our woodlands are small, fragmented, um, and they don't really, uh, uh, they're not really amenable to sort of large-scale factory production, efficient production. So to tackle that, we looked at creating a network of uh, um, smaller woodland owners um, and, and woodland managers and uh, woodsmen and women um, and to create a network of those local producers to supply uh, the national retailers and get these sorts of products like charcoal and firewood from these woodlands into our high streets so that it became the easy option for people to buy these uh, sorts of products. And we were able then uh, to help support ma uh, reintroduction of management to, to some of our woodlands. And in managing those woodlands, we can also create uh, habitats uh, for wildlife, such as this uh, pearl-bordered fritillary butterfly. And, you know, it's lovely to have been part of, of a project which has helped reintroduce management uh, and, and create space for these beautiful butterflies. And if every product and every service that we consumed could tell that sort of beautiful story of positive environmental and social benefits, then I think we would start living well on the world. And, you know, there are lots of products and services now coming through uh, with that story behind them. So we started uh, looking at hmm, paper, trees coming down, that's a bad thing. Some forestry practices are, are great, but also 
old growth forests do come down to make our paper. So way back then we thought, hmm, taking that bioregional approach, how could we produce our paper more locally and more sustainably? What resources have we got available? So that's the bioregional thing to do. What resources have we got around and what do we need? So we've got waste paper, we've got straw. So we, we thought about this idea of a sustainable local paper loop where uh, people recycle their paper. We set up this marketing scheme where people could recycle their paper to the nearby mill in Kent, which is super efficient, and buy the paper back. And we, we set up London's first curbside recycling collection service. Uh, and now, that's just every day. There's loads of them in London now. And we've actually sold that company on to a, to a like-minded um, competitor. Uh, and we've also been working on uh, creating new technology to enable local small-scale pulp production, uh, and that's our pilot plant in Manchester, which is lots of fun gasification plants and engineers and all that sort of thing. Uh, and that'd be a great thing, especially for Asia. Um, so this local paper loop that we conceived, um, we had an ecological footprint and life cycle assessment done, and it would reduce our, the ecological footprint of our paper use by 93%. So you can start to see with the charcoal product and the paper product how we can start to produce things and achieve one planet living and still have paper and charcoal. Um, and then in the mid-1990s, our um, organisation was growing. We were running out of space. So, so Sue said, well, why don't we build some green offices? And I rather naively and blindly said, OK, well, I'll, I'll go out and see if we can do that. Um, and we approached the local authority, asked them if they had any land uh, which we could build some offices on. They said, no, but we're selling some land for residential development. Why don't you build uh, um, an eco-village and you can have your offices in the centre of that. So we put together the project that became BEDSED, Bennington Zero Fossil Energy Development, with 100 homes and um, office space for about 100 people as well. And we've tried to create a whole sustainable lifestyle here for ourselves. We live there as well as have our offices there. Uh, so they're very energy efficient. We use 50% less energy, very water efficient, 50% less uh, water. Uh, we've reduced... Um, uh, car use um, and introduced uh, a car club. So we've had a 65% reduction in uh, private car use. Um, and we've measured the footprints of, of the people living at Bedzed. Some do well because of their lifestyle choices. So some get pretty close to a one planet level. Others, um, they might be saving energy in their homes, but they're also taking a lot of overseas holidays or trips and they might be a four, five, six planet lifestyle. So what we need to do is um, not only have the hardware for sustainability, the sorts of places we build, the services and products we provide, but also the software. We need to get our culture, our behavior, our choices uh, to match with living well on this planet. Uh, and we took the lessons from BEDZ and uh, we've been working more in, uh, in the mainstream now with developers uh, around the world doing this sort of project um, cost effectively, such as uh, this project here in, in Brighton. Uh, and then helping, you know, working with partners around the world to see how One Planet Living can become a reality in different parts of the world. Uh, in uh, uh, poorer countries of the world, you know, there, can we create sustainable communities which will enable people to increase their standard of living but not put in the sort of in infrastructure which long-term will start uh, uh, depleting natural resources and putting more pressure on the planet uh, than it's already under. So in South Africa, for example, and then in China with a um, developer there, um, China merchants who put in a One Planet Experience Center um, within the development so that uh, children and future purchasers could come around and find out about um, uh, green living. Uh, so hopefully sowing the seeds uh, for a future generation uh, for, which sustain for whom sustainable living will be much more natural than it is for us. Uh, and we need to do this all around the world. And we need to come up with our own local solutions, which are locally applicable, which uh, uh, allow our lives to be re-integrated uh, with local ecosystems. Uh, and at BEDZ, I think one of the great uh, benefits, which we hadn't particularly predicted, um, was that um, there's a lot of social benefit uh, to this. So the average person at BEDZ knows 20 of their neighbours by name, creating a lot of social capital, where the UK average is somewhere between three and eight, depending on, on, on where you live. And, uh, you know, people do enjoy living there. 70% of people have, uh, say they have a significantly increased quality of life. 
uh, and Tom and Yonetta moved in when Yonetta was pregnant first. They had a one-bedroom apartment. As their family grew, they just waited to get a bigger uh, home in the development uh, rather than move out of the development. And I think it's really interesting to find this sweet spot between uh, places, products, services, which bring environmental benefits and social benefits. Uh, and working with partners, we have created a sort of framework to communicate sustainability, communicate One Planet Living uh, with 10 principles which cover social, environmental, economic factors. And these are being used all around the world. It was used, in fact, for the Olympics as well to frame the sustainability uh, plan for the Olympics. It's being used by retailers like B&Q. So, uh, you know, and, and anyone can use these. Uh, uh, and we see it as sort of DNA uh, from uh, the work that we've done, which is now spreading around the world. So I think we've shown you, hopefully you believe, that One Planet Living is possible with, with some of those examples. You can start to see they're like the jigsaw pieces of, of our sustainable future. From our point of view, we believe we really could achieve a sustainable future. Uh, and what really makes us puzzled is, well, we know we've been beavering away and been able to do these things. Other people have been doing other great projects. But it's too late now for any more demonstration projects. You know, this is something that we all need to get on with. And what's stopping us? And there's something about human nature, maybe, that's making it difficult for us to, to move forward. And I guess um, that's why I'd kind of like to leave you with a couple of questions in terms of what do you think, why do you think that we can't all move forward wholeheartedly into this sustainable future? And the second question and thing to think about is we're taking these uh, real-life examples and case studies to Rio Plus 20, that's the Earth Summit next year, and we're going to be talking about these real solutions and calling on world leaders. We think that they should all, um, every country, should have some sort of strategy or plan to enable its citizens to achieve one planet living. Uh, so the final question for you to think about is, if you ruled the world and you were in charge of Rio and making the world sustainable, what would you do? Thank you. Okay, thank you.